listening to Cinema Jaw, the greatest movies podcast ever, recorded on location from a bunch of different places, but around Chicago. My name is Matt Kane. With me is Rye, the movie guy, and with us is KP. Hello. This week on Cinema Jaw, Matt, three big reviews, which makes it a review o rama. Back to back review o ramas here on Cinema Jaw. That's what happens when so many movies come out peak summer season yeah they're they're coming bang 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 although a bit of a week fourth of july weekend we'll talk about it we will our three big reviews this week quiet place day one big big maxine maxine big big and then a family affair nicole kidman zach efron Huge. big for netflix i would say it was the number one movie on Netflix yeah. when we watched it. Well, and we'll we'll unpack all of those for the Jawheads. We will indeed. No guest again this week. Another stump the Kempinski, and in honor of a family affair, we are playing Nicole Kidman, Zac Efron, movie trivia for the Kempinski stump. Interesting. We'll see how that goes. And. We gave Kevin Costner one extra week last week on the podcast, but that was enough, Kevin. We do start here July. Happy 4th. Hope you have all your fingers after the 4th of July, Matt. You didn't blow off any. Yep, I'm, he's showing me. Yeah, not yet. Did not blow off any fingers. Good, good move. We are going to move over to a new person to celebrate, and we're going to do interested or ignore here on a movie that this gentleman is in. And I know, Matt, your answer, because this was one of your uh, picks for summer movie preview that you're looking forward to very intensely. Uh, the month of July here on Cinema Jaw, we will be celebrating one Hugh Jackman. What do you think of that? Yeah, I mean, just a regular size Jackman would have been fine enough, but uh, a huge Jackman? Can't wait. Hugh Jackman. I'm shocked we haven't celebrated him, actually, in all the time that we've been celebrating somebody. I had to look through our list, and sure enough, we have not done Hugh Jackman. He needed one more role as Wolverine for us to celebrate, and now here we are. It's He's due. Yes. He is due. So let's kick this month off with a Hugh Jackman fact. Yes, as we all know, the greatest showman was born in Sydney, Australia. He's not an American. Uh, he, he was born 1968. He majored in communications at the University of Technology in Sydney, Australia. And originally, he had wanted to be a journalist. That's actually very similar to my career trajectory uh, but during his senior year however the actor found himself a few credits short for graduation and he decided to take a drama class just to like fill up that space and now we have Hugh Jackman wow One class that's all it takes that's all it takes he caught the he caught the acting bug <laughs> I, I, I want to know when he learned to sing I gotta go get that acting class under my belt I was going to say, I, I think a lot of people who are journalists, especially the ones that want to be in front of the camera doing the news, have, to some degree, a showmanship about them because they want to be in front of the camera. There, there's something inside them that says, yeah, I want to be a performer. I don't think they quite know, like a Hugh Jackman doesn't know until he got into those drama classes and then suddenly, hey, I like acting, you know? Makes sense. Is Hugh Jackman like... What's the word I'm looking for here? I don't want to say plastic because I feel like that's mean to journal, like news anchors. But his kind of pretty is a very different kind of pretty for the news. But I, I would love, I would love Hugh Jackman to tell me that a tornado just blew through Dubuque. <laughs> Dubuque. I love it. But what's interesting is I don't even know Hugh Jackman's first role. Can we throw that in the fish tank? I'd like to know, did he start off with something big? What's your guess, Matt? Ah, I mean, the first thing I'm aware of him in was the original X Men. I, I'm so what? I'm sure that's and, and not his KP, first, but uh, that's what sure, I'm going K, with. KP, there's probably something like Australia. You know, in, go for like first American Hollywood movie that we would know him. That would be awesome. Oh, and it should be noted for the Jawheads, we are recording over Zoom this week. So if anything sounds a little different, it should sound pretty much the same. I mean, we did Zoom for years during the pandemic, but uh, here we are because we're all in our various places for the fourth. Or at least I am. Correct. Yes. Matt is Michigan. KP has moved back into the city of Chicago. We're very excited about this. And 
I'm still over here in Wicker Park, but yes, we are recording via Zoom. Yeah, we can't let a jaw go by. We have to serve the jaw heads, Ryan. It's our responsibility. 100%. And uh, speaking of responsibility, we like to go interested or ignore on notable films that are coming out this month. And there were three that we uh, have circled here. So let's kick it off with interested or ignore other movies we will be discussing this month of July. Yes, I have a feeling that Ryan is going to be against this one for the title and title alone, and it is called Long Legs. FBI agent Lee Harker is assigned to an unsolved serial killer case that takes an unexpected turn, revealing evidence of the occult. Harker discovers a personal connection to the killer and must stop him before he strikes again. The film stars Micah Monroe and the great Nicolas Cage former uh, theme of the month. It is written and directed by Oz Perkins, who previously directed Gretel and Hansel, not the other way around, that's very important, and The Black Coat's Daughter. This hits theaters July 12th. Uh, Ryan, what do we got? I am very interested in Long Legs. Even with that title, KP, I'm very interested. This has been getting some great buzz around and in fact there was a screening last week and i know someone who went up to the music box and saw this in 35 millimeter and when i asked like how scary it is he he basically said he just couldn't put it on the normal level of a horror film it just messes with your head i'm pumped for this one and i noticed in the trailer they don't really show nick cage this is is not being shown as like your typical nick cage-esque movie uh so i'm i'm excited to see what happens here matt uh interested just take it out of the package if jawheads if you if you were listening with eagle ears last week our sound machine died 10 years ago i i bought ryan a backup he's brought it but has not taken it out here we go anyway interested uh, but i am very trepidatious my taste for horror has waned considerably in my age i know that's blasphemy but here i am Maybe it's because I have kids. I don't know, but I'm I'm scared for this one. It's freaky. KP, you know I gotta be honest. I wasn't until Ryan sold me on it. Uh, Nick Cage. I- I'm amazed Matt Matt's love for Nick Cage is not outweighing horror at this moment in time uh, because the guy's incredible. As well as uh, I do think I think Gretel and Hansel. Maybe it was just the age I came out. I was in like junior high or something. I thought it was actually kind of fun, and I remember, I haven't seen it in like 15 years, but I remember being like, oh, that was kind of cool. So I'm in. <laughs> I, I actually think, KP, that may be a different Gretel and Hensel. I, I, I'm pretty sure. Throw it in the fish tank. I think there's two out there. Both Gretel backwards? and Hensel, it's, yeah. The, the backwards one is more the horror film yeah. than I think the one... It is? Yeah. That's, yeah, see, yeah, when yeah, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. See when it came out. I'm guessing within the last eight years. Really? Yeah. True story. Noted. Three, three interested for long legs, however. We will have a review. We are seeing that next week. All right, guys. This one I know is a blast from the past. And I actually think, what would it be like if Hugh Jackman predicted this one, twisters, plural? Uh, haunted by a devastating devastating encounter with the tornado, Kate Cooper gets lured back into the open plains by her friend Javi to test a groundbreaking new tracking system. She soon crosses paths with Tyler Owens, a charming but reckless social media superstar who thrives on posting his storm-chasing adventures. A storm season intensifies. Kate, Tyler, and their competing teams find themselves in the fight for their lives as multiple systems cover multiple systems converge over central Oklahoma. This film stars Glenn Powell and Karen Shipka. The film is directed by Lee Isaac Chung, whose last directed film was 2022's Minari. This blows into theaters July 19th. I got it. Matt, I got, I'm dying to know. Okay. Okay. I have a quick story about the movie Twister. It. I don't remember exactly what year it came out, but it came out simultaneously with the David Schwimmer mega hit Paul Bearer. And I wanted to go see, Tw- I was joking about the mega hit. I wanted to go see Twister and somehow my friends roped me into the David Schwimmer movie. So I developed this weird <laughs> fascination. Some friends. Yeah, right? No pun intended there. Uh, 
so I got uh, this weird fascination with the movie Twister. I bought it on DVD, and it was one of those movies I played all the time. Do I think it's a good movie? No. Do I think it's a fun movie? Hell yeah. So I am extremely excited for Twisters. This may shock you because I'm Mr. Serious on the on the podcast, but I'm actually interested in Twisters as well. I, I agree with you, Matt. It looks like uh, it's going to be silly. It's going to be fun, like the first one. However, I have never actually watched the first one from start to finish all the way through. I've always seen like bits and pieces of it and enjoyed it that way. The flying cow. I know it well enough. But uh, Glenn Powell in this one. All right. I mean, he's an up and coming star. Let's let's have some fun. It, it'll at least be an entertaining trip to the theater. True. True. Popcorn movie. KP. Here's the thing. I don't think Twister is a good movie by any stretch of the imagination, but it is a fun movie. Yep. Now we're going to add on millennial horse shit and Gen Z horse shit where like people are doing the storm chaser shit from their phones. And then we're going to add on the fact of Lee Isaac Chung coming fresh out of Minari. That film was awesome. And like, I, it, absolutely, absolutely. This is going but to I, be so much fun. Um, that's three interests. I, I just can't believe that he's, he made Minari. That's how yeah. I say it. Minari. I'm not as, uh, perfect, uh, you know, with my translation as KP over there, but what a strange jump from Minari, which was nothing to do with storm chasing special effect tornadoes. And then to go into this, it's, it's going to be quite interesting. That poor Korean family's farm. It's just going to go up into the guy. It's actually a sequel. <laughs> yeah, they're going to get hit by a tornado. That's, that's how this whole thing starts. <laughs> that would be absolutely awesome if that's how it started. <laughs> Three interesteds for Twisters. What else we got? It's going to be a fun month, okay? Because we're diving into it. Hugh Jackman, okay? Hugh M. Effing Jackman. We are talking Deadpool and, Deadpool and Wolverine. The synopsis is like this. Wolverine is recovering from his injuries when he crosses paths with the loud-mouthed Deadpool. They team up to defeat a common enemy. Ryan Reynolds and, of course, Hugh Jackman star in this film. It is directed by Sean Levy, who has directed Reynolds' last couple of films, Free Guy and The Atom Project. It is in theaters everywhere July 26th. Matt, clearly you're where we're going with this. Yeah, guys, I'm I'm a sucker. I'm ready for a good Marvel movie. It's been too long. I am big time interested. Absolutely. Uh, I am going to play spoiler here, Matt. And um, it, it really shouldn't shock you when I, I say that I'm actually going to ignore this one. <laughs> oh, boo. I mean, the first two Deadpools. I know. Be over. So they did to a degree. But did I need a third Deadpool is the question. And the answer would be no. I would have been totally fine if we never saw Deadpool again. And I've heard and at least read from social media blurbs that I've seen that people are very excited that we're seeing like the uh, old look of Wolverine. And obviously this is some type of prequel in the timeline. And I know this throws Matt off. We, we heard it on Furiosa. Like we already know she survives. So we know Hugh Jackman survives. No, 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 uh, no, no. Using Matt's. Yeah, because he died in, in, in Wolverine. This is not Logan. that Wolverine. This is a Wolverine variant from a different timeline. It is? Yes. Then I definitely don't want to say no, this it. Wolverine I thought this could was the die. original Wolverine. I'm just saying that this Wolverine could die. And I don't oh know that God. from any kind of spoilers or anything. That's right in the trailer. They say this Wolverine failed at saving his world. So it's a Wolverine oh, I see. with a chip on his shoulder. And we've already seen all the, 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 the TVA in the trailer, which is the time variance uh, authority. So it, there's some time travel hijinks here, which he, you know, Deadpool did time travel at the end of the last one and... Okay, well, I'm yeah. glad you informed me on that. The other thing is, is that they're very excited that this is, looks like the uh, original Wolverine, whatever the hell that it's means. It's the 90s so, cartoon Wolverine, his yellow uh, I have thoughts on costume. this, too, if we want to so, circle back on so, the Jim Lee edition. Yes, please. So on that note, I, I know people are excited about this, but not being like a, a fan of Wolverine before the movies ever came out, I have no uh, starting point to say, like, ooh, I'm excited to see this Wolverine in, in, in the yellow original costume or whatever. And, and if I'm being quite honest, 
until I knew Matt and a few, it really just a couple years ago, did I know that Deadpool and Wolverine were in the same universe? I didn't even know they knew each other. Um, I didn't know all this. So I, I mean, I just, I'm not excited for it. That's why I would give it ignore. Are, am I going to see it? Yes. Do I hope it's good? Yes. I'll talk about it when we see it. But for my money, technically this would be an ignore. Ooh. What about you, KP? KP. I am giving this the slightest, like absolute slightest, like 51% interested uh, possible because I actually just, I think the Jim Lee costume work that they did sucks. It sucks. Uh, the, the original, the yellow Wolverine suit is like so iconic and this doesn't, I, I don't know. I, I can't stand it. I think Matt, I, it has this bothered you from the images at all either like the, the, piece that goes around his head his cowl and then he's got like the is that what it's called yes it's called the a cowl a cowl and he's got like the the blue pointy things it's awesome and we're missing that i just and i also i'm kind of tired of the deadpool bit uh and i'm kind of tired of ryan reynolds because they're one in the same thing at this point in time i feel like every possible joke that they could possibly made they have already made 8,000 times before in the previous two films, Adam Project and Free Guy, as well as I'm sure in If they made these jokes and the other two Deadpools, they made these jokes. The only thing that I am, that is, that is keeping me interested in this is very specifically the Hugh Jackman Wolverine. Uh, because I still love the guy no matter what. He, he does a good job with this role. But there's a lot of like ball drops, I think, already. Time will tell. Wow concerns from kp an ignore from rye the movie guy and a very enthusiastic interested from matt k we will see this one at the end of the month and we shall see exactly what we have in store exciting month of july i think we got going here indeed why don't we jump into this review of rama ryan with a quiet place day one the first A Quiet Place was an original and mold-breaking take on the typical post-apocalypse survival horror. After two sequels, we ask ourselves, how did it all begin? And that's the question answered in A Quiet Place Day One. Now attach the director, Michael Sarnowski, who also gave us the wonderful film, Pig, and you have my attention. But can this latest entry in the trilogy <clears throat> make some noise? Or is it just a fart in the wind? Ryan and I held our breath to find out. This Friday, what do we do? Save everyone we can. I have a plan. This was my first Quiet Place movie, and I can see how the original must have been a fascinating watch indeed. This had to be the quietest movie I have ever seen in the theater, and I applaud silently. That being said, this is the third in a series, and I imagine that the film needed to deliver much more than more of the same. Lupita Nyong'o stars as Sam, a woman on hospice care living in a nursing home. Her group takes a field trip to New York City to see a show, and the promise of pizza draws Sam onto the bus, to which I must say, Sam, I am from New York, and I've lived in Chicago for 25 years. I get it. Wouldn't you know it, all hell breaks loose as the sound-sensing demogorgons from Stranger Things land and kill anything that makes a peep. Stupid. Since Sam is terminal and does not expect to live much longer, she decides to continue her quest for a good slice of New York pizza and not even an alien invasion will stop her. Again, Sam from, Sam from the land of the deep dish, I get it. Speaking of Stranger Things, along the way she meets Eric, played by Eddie Munson himself, Joseph Quinn. I found this character confusing. We're never told precisely what his deal is other than a vague backstory about being a lawyer. One has to suppose that he's been traumatized by the attack. We also meet Henry, a name I only gleaned from the credits, and he's played by Digimon Hansu. His character is equally confusing, at one point seeming to set up some sort of subtext, only for that to be completely unexplored for the rest of the movie. I have to wonder what landed on the cutting room floor. Sarnowski does nothing original and nothing very interesting with the story or its visuals. Sure, it looks professional, but there are no wow moments that aren't in the trailer. 
this movie is a mess. What may have worked as a premise for a high concept indie swing fails at this scale and characters start threads that are never finished. The lack of dialogue no doubt works in favor of this storyless script, but you'll walk away with a shrug. Even the creatures themselves are not very scary, sort of a cross between Dark Crystal and the aforementioned Demogorgon, but not as good. Cloverfield and even the American Godzilla did this much better. If you ask me to sum up A Quiet Place Day One in one sentence, I would say this. A terminally ill woman decides to get her last slice amidst the deadly alien invasion. And trust me, that description is better than this entire movie. I would give it the meh emoji. Epic fail. Wow. Holy crap. You came out firing Matt Kay and you are completely wrong. Nothing new. Oh, but Jesus Christ, Ryan. Don't tell me you like this piece of shit. Here's, here's what's odd about this. Very strange. And I'm glad that you admitted to the Jawheads, this is your first time seeing a Quiet Place movie. And I do find that rather fascinating because I think if you start it here, this is a very weak spot to start at. It, it, it is not what made the series so great. I, I think the original one with John Krasinski uh, that he directed and, and starred in, was great that it had started long after the invasion. I forget exactly how many days, but it starts with like day whatever that they're out there. And the world is already, we're not worried about how they got here or the invasion itself. Now it's centered on a family. And all we knew was that they had to be absolutely quiet because these aliens had supersonic hearing. And that that was like the whole interesting premise of a Quiet Place sure. and obviously carried over to a, a Quiet Place Day 2. This one, they, they, they give us the promise of, of how it's going to come out, um, you know, how it, how it all started day one. And, and the opening uh, gives us a little bit of uh, context as, as far as how loud New York City is uh, decibel-wise. Yeah, so. And it's like, oh, this is going to be really interesting because obviously these things just absolutely go after all, all of the loud noises that are, are going to be uh, made. And this is where I thought the movie made some bad choices. So I'm not fully on board with this one. I, I wanted to see them really wreak havoc. And, and we live in a very dumb world, do we not, Matt Kay? Most people are, are absolute complete a-holes. You, everybody's on their phone in the theater. People are making noise. They're doing FaceTime when they're walking around the store. Everybody's a jerk. Now we have these aliens come down to New York, start attacking anything that's making noise. And in my opinion, that would go on for three days to maybe three weeks before anybody would realize that you had to be quiet around these these uh, aliens to try to be safe but here in the movie we're watching Lapita uh, around she gets knocked unconscious and when she comes to which in my opinion would probably be less than an hour she comes to the people around her are already telling her to be quiet there's like an alien outside shh shh it, it just wouldn't happen that fast do you agree oh I totally agree there's there's nothing about this premise that makes any kind of sense and nor is it satisfying in terms of us learning anything about the creatures new um, or from whence they came or what started this invasion and yada, yada, yada. It's, it's very Cloverfield. There's nothing here, Ryan. I don't know what saved this movie for you. Well, the thing that is great is in all of the Quiet Place now, all three of them, especially the first, it's about this family that you care about and, and their survival. And the same in the second one. And in this one, it was kind of like a makeshift family with Eric and Sam, who, yes, we don't know his backstory, but I actually appreciated that because what are the odds of, of some random guy in New York City running into L Lapita Nyako's character, Sam, and and all they are are just two survivors, two people trying to, to live. That's all we needed to be. And I like that it didn't turn necessarily like romantic or get too deep that we knew these people had some sort of backstory together. I appreciated the fact that it was like two strangers in New York and a cat. Let's throw the cat in there. And you're a cat person. You got to talk so about the cat. Yeah, that. that's in my jaw dropping moment. And so you got the cat and these two people trying to survive 
basically pure chaos in New York City. And I appreciated that. I still thought the film delivered some tense scenes that are are really layups at this point for the movie because the whole point is that you have to be quiet. It, It lends itself well to some tense moments. Nothing is bad or as good as Emily Blunt stepping on a nail in the first one or trying to give birth to a baby when you can't make any noise. All of that way more intense, but this one had some some decent scenes. This did not give me any reason to to see the other movies whatsoever. And and I'm sorry, the the character of Eric, he needed a little something to explain to me why he was following Lapita Nyong'o around. He's like a lost cat himself. Uh, which brings me to my jaw-dropping moment. I might as well just go ahead and say the cat is amazing in this movie. The one thing I love the most about the movie is the cat. Turns out practical kitties were used during the filming of this. The role was split between two felines, Schnitzel and Nico. And that's, I have to take my hat off to Sarnowski. That is his biggest directorial achievement with A Quiet Place Day One is directing two cats. That's really his crowning achievement with this movie. He can take that one to the bank. Good job with the cats, but the rest dude, I, look, and let's talk about this character, Henry, that she meets at the the puppet show, the theater where the, the whole thing kicks off. Mm-hmm. We, we see him. He's a father. He's trying to set a good example for his son, but at one point he has to make a tough choice. He doesn't exactly do something bad on purpose, but something bad happens. And he looks to see if his son is there. Is that explored any further? No, not whatsoever. We don't, but the dis. I think, yeah, I think the the moment that he makes that decision, and um, and you know something bad happens that would stay with him. If anything, this was a bit more realistic of how someone would react to that. I don't think they were looking for it to be explored any further than it was just in that moment. But if if you had to do that as a normal person who was was put to the test and you didn't really want to harm anybody, but everybody else's lives were were in danger and something push comes to shove and you do something that was the moment in the movie i i really appreciated that uh, i didn't so basically what you're saying is, is you you appreciate a movie with characters that we don't get to know whose motivations are completely unclear and whose subtexts and choices are left completely underexplored that's what you're saying they're trying to survive there's there, there's an alien invasion she's and these terminally people are brought Ill. together in absolute chaos she doesn't want to survive she just wants a damn piece of pizza so yeah, movie. And that brings me to my, but that brings me to that would never happen moment. I mean, I I've went to New York on a weekend and I tried their pizza. It's absolute shit. Nobody oh, would go out man. of their this way for pizza is over. in New York. This podcast Nobody is Nobody would go out of their way. What and they're, are they're, you she's going to go all the way to this other neighborhood to get a, a, a slice of New York style pizza. It's crap. So we can now see, ladies and gentlemen, why the movie guy's tastes are completely off the chart wrong you're just wrong (laughs) right forget that noise my jaw-dropping moment is a wonderful scene in the sewer where one of the aliens comes up on the roof of the uh, sewer and you have uh sam and eric the characters in the water and they're also carrying a cat trying to keep the cat afloat over the water and of course some noise gets made and one of the aliens comes stomping down the the roof of the uh sewer that entire sequence was well played out on screen you got to give that credit uh okay you got to man i'm not giving him credit that's been done i thought that i thought that was enjoyable all right my that would never happen is is very similar to yours it's the cat okay listen that cat goes underwater several times and it comes up and it's totally (laughs) calm that would never happen my cat fell in the bathtub once freaked the hell out I mean, the cat was like running around the bathtub trying to get out. It was hilarious, but that cat was not calm. This cat goes underwater in the sewer. They jump in in the East River, and the the cat's like, okay, let's just keep going. No problem here. Bullshit. That would never happen. I agree. And there was a scene where the cat was in the rafters uh, up on like some beams, and an alien was in there. And and there just moments, the cat would just never react so calm and so quietly. The cat would have jumped, things would have fell, hissed, uh, meowed. So there, yeah, there there were some some moments there with the cat that were just way too hard to believe. I I agree. All right, how about a movie poster quote, Matt? All right, my movie poster quote is, shh, or you know, don't. That's my quote. <laughs> 
I went with uh, a little play off the aliens, uh, famous tagline. So for this one, a quiet place day one, I went with on earth, everyone can hear you scream. I think we have both had some better movie poster quotes in the past. <laughs> How many jaws are you getting? So this, this is, this is not my favorite quiet place. In fact, I would put this in third place. Um, I think the first one, best second one goes in order one two three but i still enjoyed this one enough to go three jaws oh my god you need to have your ears checked to ride the movie guy this is a one and a half jaw movie i mean listen i'm sure you're a fan of the first two movies but it, it, this movie does not stand on its own therefore it is a pile of shit i'm giving it 1.5 jaws and i honestly think that the 0. 0.5 is just for lapita nyango because she's a great actor really good Wow. Three jaws for Rye the Movie Guy, one and a half for Matt K. If you see Quiet Place Day One, shoot us a tweet at Cinnamon Jaw or our email, feedback at cinnamonjaw.com. On to our second review. It was two years ago, Ty West and Mia Goth teamed up for X and Pearl, released just months apart. It was the first two films in a planned horror trilogy. I recently rewatched X. And I'm glad I did, as it was a nice refresher for the third and final installment, Maxine. This latest film is set in 1985, and once again, Mia Goth plays Maxine Minx, an adult film actress who survived the massacre in the film X. Can she find her big break and cross over to the mainstream? Or will the Night Stalker slice her dreams to pieces? I hit a theater with sticky floors stepped into a booth, and dropped a few quarters in the machine to get a look. So, Maxine, your agent tells us you're quite a popular name in adult film and entertainment, is that correct? I'm curious, did you always want to be in that line of work? I always wanted to be famous. Maxine is determined to become a legit movie star. When the film opens, we get this wonderful audition scene that really shows off Mia Goth's talents. Taking place in Hollywood circa 1985, we get a heavy dose of 80s nostalgia. In the background, on flickering tube TVs, we get news reports of the Night Stalker, a serial killer who is killing young women all around L.A., as Maxine lands her first role, her and the Night Stalker's paths seem destined to cross. I went into this film with high expectations, and unfortunately, they were not fully met. This is not to say that I didn't like the picture. I did, but I wanted more. To me, it felt like Maxine never knew exactly what it wanted to be, which shocks me as X and Pearl both have a singular vision. This installment is one part erotic thriller, one part serial killer, and at the same time, trying to be a send-up to the 80s. This proved to be too much, as I found Maxine to have an identity crisis. It's a shame because the cast here is amazing. Mia Goth, as I mentioned, fantastic. And so is Kevin Bacon, Elizabeth Debicki, and Bobby Carnavale. The music was on point, although I actually could have used a little more synth in the score. As far as the horror element, decent at best. There was one scene that I had to look away for a brief second, but overall I did not find Maxine scary at all, unfortunately. I found this to be a case where the whole was not greater than the sum of its parts, which is odd. I liked a lot of it, but still walked away wanting more from the narrative. That's a shame. They did not stick the landing. Similar to A Quiet Place, huh? They, it's just diminishing yeah, returns. I, I mean, it, it's interesting that we're in actually thinking about this. We're doing the third installment back to back here in two from trilogies. A Quiet Place, and now in yeah, in two trilogies, um, and in a, in a way out of order, right? You went with X, and then they did a prequel, Pearl, and now a sequel to X, and you know, obviously, we had a prequel in A Quiet Place, so interesting to see them move the installments around maybe it was my expectations were a little too high but i really did uh walk out of this and and you know the, the publicists always ask for your take and i just said i i don't know if if ty west knew the movie he wanted to make where 
He knew it in X, what they were going for. Pearl clearly had a vision. Jeez, this was kind of all over the map as far as like, oh, is this going to be like an ode to the 80s? Is this going to be like really concentrate on the serial killer side? Or is this going to actually be like an erotic thriller? Like, you know, and it, it, I don't think the film itself can make up its mind where it was going to land. And, and maybe that to some people listening, that sounds like a good thing. To me, it just didn't gel enough to come out as, as the narrative was like, wow, that's exactly what I wanted. To me, it was all kind of mm. up in the air. That's a shame, man, because this is a, a highly anticipated capstone on what was two of the better horror movies of the last five years, you know? Um, for for sure. And and I don't want to take anything away from Mia Goth. And I, I, she's just impressed the hell out of me with all three of these films. I, she just keeps getting better. Like in X, she was very solid. In Pearl, she was phenomenal. Like, wow, unbelievable. And in here, I think this is actually her best work. Again, going back to that audition scene early on in this film, Maxine, it, it's, it's so great. It reminds me very much reminiscent of Emma Stone's uh, audition scenes in La La Land where you really get to, you know, show off your talents. And to hear she just goes on a dime, uh, switches from character to actually Maxine right in front of these uh, three people. And it was just such an entertaining scene. And I thought, wow, I'm going to really like this. This is 10 minutes into the movie. And then it just started to lose its its footing, its direction of exactly where it wanted to go. And I, I just couldn't latch on to something to, to hold on to and, and enjoy. I don't know. Was there a, that would never happen with this? Not, not so much. Uh, I didn't, I didn't write one down with a, that would never happen moment, but, uh, how about a jaw drop? I, I, jaw drop for sure. I do want to mention how great Kevin Bacon is in this. Um, so I wrote down two things. I said, highlight Kevin Bacon because it's only a small role, uh, for the Baconator, but boy, this guy, really nails it here. And I'd like to see a little bit more of this now that he's gotten older. He's like a character uh, actor in this one playing uh, like a, I, I don't want to give too much away because that would spoil some things, but he's in, in the realm of like a, a, a detective excellent turn by Kevin Bacon. And then the scene that I want to highlight is there is a moment where they are making like a sil a silicone mask of Maxine. She gets a role in a movie and they got to pour this gel all over her face that's going to make a mold of her head. And the makeup artist pours this gel all over her so it's covering her eyes, her her you know nose, mouth, and they tell her, just be quiet and wait here for 10 minutes and I'll be right back. And of course, there's this killer on the, on the loose, the Night Stalker. This scene with this gel all over her face and not being able to see who else is in the room with you very well played by Ty West. Creeped the hell out of me. That was awesome. That's great. Do you got a movie poster quote? I went with struggles to find its identity, but is lifted up by its amazing cast. Cool. All right. Well, how many jaws? Where do we land? So I brushed off very slowly, brushed off the quarter jaw here, Matt, and I went 2.75. Ooh. So okay. 2.75. I thought going in, this had a chance to be one of my like highlights of the summer, you know, three and a half, four jaw territory. Not quite there, but enjoyable enough. Maxine, 2.75. I can't wait to see it. I definitely want to finish out the, uh, the trilogy, man. Can't leave this one a question mark. Jawheads, if you see this, let us know if you agree with me. Did it have trouble finding the exact footing that it needed? Let us know. Shoot us an email, feedback at cinemajaw.com. We are going to take a quick break. When we come back, we got to open up the fish tank, give another review of A Family Affair, and play some trivia. Stick with us. Let's, let's, let's all go to the lobby. Let's Kicking off Hugh Jackman month, I go to a classic directed by Christopher Nolan, The Prestige. And in this clip, Hugh Jackman comes up to his confidant, Michael Caine, and says how does he do this trick they want to learn how christian bale is doing this trick and this conversation ensues did they applaud when you saw it the trick was too good it was too simple the audience hardly had time to see it he's a dreadful magician no he's a wonderful magician he's a dreadful showman he doesn't know how to dress it up how to sell the well, how does he do it 
He uses a double. No, 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 no. It's too simple. This is a complex illusion. You only say that because you don't know the method. It's a double that comes out at the end. It's the only way. I've seen him perform the trick three times now, Mr. Carter. The prestige is the same man. No, it's not. The same man comes out of that second cabinet, I promise you. It's the same man. He wears padded gloves to hide his damaged fingers, but if you look closely, you can tell. He doesn't know how to sell his trick to an audience, but I do. Yeah, well, we can use it as a climax of the show. Yes. The man stole my life. I'm gonna steal his trick. We've got to find someone who looks like you on stage. He doesn't use a dog. Robert, I don't know how Borden does the trick. So uh -huh. either you either wait for him to retire and buy the secret, or you listen to how I would do it. And the only way that I know how to do it is to find you a bloody good double. Take a good look. Let's get out there and find me. Sparkling drinks, sparkling drinks, and all dandy, 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 dandy. And we are back on Cinema Jaw, and we just put the capstone on two trilogies. But you know what we didn't do, Ryan? We did not open the fish tank. I say it's high time we did so. See if KP wants to put a capstone on her trilogy. Wait a moment. Who's coming with me besides Flipper? Here. That's a Sicilian message. That means Luca Brasi sleeps with the fishes. You're gonna need a bigger boat. Thank you so much. You make it sound like I'm dying. Is there something? I, yeah, I, I didn't know, need to. Matt, <laughs> is there? <laughs> I thought I was in great health, so this is news to me too. I, I hope it's good. I hope I, it's better than the two that we did today. Did, did uh, something <laughs> happen on the move that we don't know about? Listen, a guys. lot happened that we don't know about, but it, I hope nothing. Maybe there's asbestos in the new place. I'll get my money back. Sometimes you pick a direction and you just go for it. You know, sometimes there's gold there and sometimes there's just dirt. You and me both, bud. Uh, we had we had two. We had two in here today. We're starting off. We're going right into Hugh Jackman, okay? What is Hugh Jackman's first, like, noteworthy role? Ryan did very specifically ask me to leave out the Australian ones we hadn't heard of. Uh, and there's two Australian movies before his third role where we knew him, and that's the year 2000's X-Men. His third role. His third wow. role ever was as Wolverine. And, like, oh, the dude, like... It's not just magic. It's not just lightning in a bottle. He has been like carrying that role for 24 years. 2000? So, 24 so I years and he's still getting butts in seats. He's still Wolverine. That's insane. Yeah. It is. 24 years to play one character. That might be a record, actually. Bonkers. It's got to be. It's got to be a record. And with how many movies he's made with it, too, I think that's the other thing. Like, you can have people who would come back over the course of like, I don't know, 40 years because they haven't made a sequel or whatever, like the Tron movies did. But this is consecutive work. Yeah. The guy's I mean, a phenom. It, that beats any, like, Bond actor, you know? I mean, it, for it's, sure. it's got to be a record. That's uh, impressive. I had... Then the second one, when did Gretel and Hansel come out? Ryan was so right. That was the year 2000. That wasn't even eight years ago. That was four years ago. That was pan. That was a pandemic movie. You mean twenty twenty? What was twenty yeah. twenty? You mean? Did okay. I say two thousand again? You I'm did. sorry. I'm yeah. switching these two up. Uh, <laughs> X Men was two thousand. Yeah, twenty twenty. Four years ago. I have no idea what in the hell I am confusing this with. I tried to look up <laughs> other like dark fairy tale movies from around this time, um, and I I don't think it was Amanda Seyfried's masterpiece. Red Riding Hood that I got confused with. Um, but, but needless to say, been. Gretel Gretel and Hensel and the Black Coat's Daughter, I love both these horror films. So that really adds into my anticipation for Long Legs. So guy's doing some good work. Also, while we're in the fish tank, was, was those the only questions we threw in there? That's KP? all we got, for me at least. Next Next week on the show, two big reviews, as mentioned, Long Legs and Eddie Murphy back as Axel Foley with Beverly Hills Cop. 
five is it on? There were four Beverly Hills Cops, correct? Or three? I think three. I think it's four. Yeah, this would I'm be four. I'm pretty sure it's four. Okay, so there were only three. This is the fourth one. Wow. I didn't even... This one blindsided me, man. Kind of excited so for it's, it. It's it's on Netflix. Beverly Hills Cop, I think it's called Axel F. Yeah, we're and we're so excited to hear all the Crazy Frog. If they do not play Axel F by Crazy Frog, I am going to table flip and scream. <laughs> I, I believe it's part of his contract that they have to play that song wherever, whenever he walks into a room. So it, we'll hear it. Honestly, everybody should be doing that. Agree. All right. So those are our reviews next week. I think that's everything. Jump back in that fish tank. You bet. All right. Speaking of trilogies, Ryan, this is a trilogy of reviews on this review o rama And here is the final entry for the day. It is entitled A Family Affair. Zach Efron, Nicole Kidman, Kathy Bates, and Joey King star in a new rom-com for Netflix. And the title is, as I mentioned, A Family Affair. Can the big end create a satisfyingly humorous and romantic romp, or does it fall flat on its plastic face? Ryan and I fired up the stream to find out. This is madness, right? Yeah, this is your mom. <laughs> and your boss, who you hate. It's weird. Mom? <laughs> Zara, Look. if you can hear me, name the movie I won a Teen Choice Award for. Uh, all right. I think she's fine. Rom-coms are often maligned as treacle garbage, and perhaps, largely, this is deserved. But every so often, a good one slips through, and every so often, treacle garbage is exactly what the doctor ordered. I think Family Affair falls into the latter camp. This is a tub of ice cream while you ugly cry after a breakup kind of movie. And I guess that's the best thing I can say about this movie. In A Family Affair, Joey King's character Zara is the assistant to a self-absorbed D-bag of an A-list actor in Zac Efron's Chris Cole. When Cole meets Zara's widowed mom, Brooke, played by Nicole Kidman, sparks fly and a romance develops that threatens to nauseate Zara to her core and us as the audience. Throw in Kathy Bates as the kindly, sage-like grandmother, and you have yourself a cookie-cutter formula for a wacky rom-com. Don't get it twisted. A family affair breaks no molds and paints firmly within the lines, but I found this to be rather refreshing, believe it or not. This is the cinematic equivalent of a pop chart. But hey, who doesn't like a pop tart once in a great while? An even better analogy is a running gag from the movie. Efron's character is so famous that he can't do normal things like going to the grocery store. So when he does get to go, he's just thrilled with the cereal aisle. And there it is. This movie is breakfast cereal, largely empty and devoid of nutrition, but tasty and paradoxically wholesome in its sheer sugary sweetness. The actors are all talented and likable enough to carry this one-note script over the finish line for me, and I even found myself getting a little choked up for a scene between Kathy Bates and Nicole Kidman. Again, I have to warn seasoned moviegoers not to get me wrong. Even for a movie about movies and screenwriters at that, this is a poor script, and the jokes are surface level and trite, and the broad strokes are predictable and obvious. But in that, they feel comforting. The humor is decent, while somewhat repetitive and one-dimensional. Again, it's just acted well enough. And that earnest vapidity will give you the cinematic lobotomy required to brain freeze one's senses to things like comedic timing and subtext and decent cinematography. This is a perfect recommendation for a mom or family member who isn't into the art house and just likes easy, predictable movies with a happy ending. So if that's your jam... You could do much worse. Wow. Matt, you are literally two steps away from crying at like a car commercial. <laughs> I am, dude. I'm getting old, I guess. I don't what know. What happened to you? I don't what know. happened to the, the, the guy that walked around in a leather jacket, F bomb and everything? I mean, this this guy is is crying at a Zac Zac no, Efron. I didn't cry. Kathy Listen, Bates. It's Kathy Bates. Okay. Nicole Kidman. Yeah, oh my two powerhouse God. actors. Past their prime, let's be honest, but two powerhouse actors nonetheless. They have an earnest moment. It got me a little choked. It got me. It got me. Uh, I am not saying that this is a good movie. I am not. So, but I enjoyed my, it. My take on this, 
my take on this is it, 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 look at all the movies that we we've uh, just highlighted here, much like Maxine. This is another film with a, a very talented cast. Right. Um, it, but on this one, I actually had problems with the tone and the tone being that I didn't find it funny enough, like a screwball comedy. And I didn't buy into care about or want to be even 10% invested in the romance between Zac Efron and Nicole Kidman. That was okay. It just didn't work for me. Where a, a lot of times in a romantic comedy, I'm, I want to see the, the two get together and I care about that. Here, I didn't care at all. And I, I, I'm not going to lie. I laughed out loud a couple of times. There were a couple of uh, odd lines in there, such as when they ask, uh, Zac Efron asks Nicole Kidman, he hears her accent the first time he meets her and he says, oh my God, where are you from? And she says, Australia. And his next line is, do you know Margot Robbie? <laughs> Just <laughs> bizarre stuff like that. <laughs> I did I did like some of those jokes, but I didn't care for the romance angle of these two. And you go back to another streamer that Zac Efron was just in, which was that Ricky Stanicki that we both were, were fans of, but you agreed with my criticism that Zac Efron in that movie wasn't uh, a funny enough straight guy in the movie. Like there's been better straight guys, you know, um, you know, obviously Ben Stiller being, you know, Hall of Fame straight men. Yeah. Yeah. And here, I, I I like Zac Efron. I really do. But I just think he he just didn't have the charisma that, I mean, you called him like a douchebag as far as him being like this A-list that That's can't his, go to the grocery store. His character is a douchebag. Yeah. I, I, no, I know. But I didn't even buy that from him in, in the movie. So none of it really worked for me from, from Zac Efron's standpoint. And I think that's where I think it was a little weak. I, I would have liked it to have been like just a little bit older of an actor. I, I still go ahead and play with the age uh, thing, which I liked, but maybe just somebody else that seemed more accomplished as playing like an actor who would be a superstar in their own right. I didn't buy it from Zac Efron. Mm. I just didn't. Mm. I mean, he's supposed to be like basically a Ryan Reynolds type who is who is just, you know, famous for playing superheroes and stuff like that. I mean, even Ryan Reynolds is not quite the right analogy, but you know what I'm getting at, like somewhere between Ryan Reynolds and Robert Downey Jr. in his younger days. Doesn't matter. It it does not matter. This is this is like I said, this is a cinematic pop tart. Like if you're into this kind of thing then I think, you know, like this is a perfect recommendation for, for somebody who just likes, you know, garbage movies with a happy ending and it, you could do a lot worse. It's fine. It's fine. Don't you think it could have uh, used some more jokes, a little bit more humor? I mean, something it needed a, like a, a moment with like a, a big comedic scene in there, something to build up to. I don't know. It was just lacking in, in the laughs, I thought, for being what you would call a romantic comedy. It has some decent laughs. Like you, you mentioned a couple, there's a running gag with his shirt being uh, made of this material. That's, that's super, super rare. And it, it comes back again during a, a sex scene where it gets ripped up. And that was funny. I don't know. Do I think it needed more? Yeah. I mean, obviously this needed more to be what we would call a good movie, but I think it crosses the finish line. Listen, it's, it's fine. I, I, I don't want to oversell this. Like I'm thinking this is the movie of the year. I, I, I thought it was exactly, it, it turned out to be exactly what I thought it would be, which is like a, a Netflix rom-com with, you know, some stars that are kind of past their, their prime getting a paycheck. And it, for that, it was good. Well, you got the, the cast was better than most, you know? And I, I mean, Nicole Kidman, I know you're saying past their prime, but I mean, she's still cranking them out pretty well. All right, perhaps that is Good unfair. to see Kathy Bates. Yeah. Good to see Kathy Bates in there. Um, and Joey King, who... Love Joey King. We've reviewed a few of her. Yeah, we've reviewed a few of her movies now are great. I had no issue with any of them. For me, and I like Zac Efron in, in other roles, I just think... Not here, it, much like Ricky Stanicki. Unfortunately, I think he was the weak link here. That, that's where I think it, it fell for me. There uh, was a, a jaw-dropping moment, and it's an element that I wanted to bring up because this is what I'm talking about, where uh, the movie could have went for more laughs. So in this movie, 
Zac Efron is making a, a film in which it's like a, a multiple sequel in, to this character that he always plays. And they're talking about how they need to rewrite the script. Well, we actually see this movie being made. And so that is my, my jaw dropping moment. The part that I thought was maybe the most entertaining, but that they could have explored a little bit more was seeing Zac Efron in this ridiculous wig. His hair was like white and he was on this uh, sound stage, but it was basically um, made to look like the Arctic. He was on snow uh, scenery. They they had the wind machine going. And all of that played out pretty funny. Like it was just over the top ridiculousness, but they didn't go into that enough. I would have leaned more into those those kinds of jokes um, for my money, but it, I enjoyed it, but I needed more of it. Yeah, I mean, you, it's fair what you're saying. My jaw-dropping moment is the sex scene. Joey King walks in on her mom banging her boss, and this is right in the trailer uh, and, and the synopsis, and then she turns to hightail it out of the room and just runs straight into a door jam. It was funny. I thought that that physical comedy was done pretty well, and I enjoyed it. It was, and it was kind of a one-two punch laugh because you're already laughing by just her reaction of walking in on her mom and boss um, having sex. So you're like, you got the big ha-ha going and then bam, she runs into the door, another big ha-ha moment. Yeah. It works. It works. You got a poster quote for this? I went with, as far as affairs go, this one is lame. Man, we are not on our movie poster quote game today because <laughs> i struggled with this one too like when we do the notes i sat there I, I i had all my notes down and then i sat for about 20 minutes to come up with that stupid movie poster quote i couldn't come up with anything well, i'm dipping my pen right back into the same well and saying it's a cinematic pop tart but it's my favorite flavor so is it my favorite flavor i don't know i'm i'm i'm, I'm being kind to this movie i just it, it hit me at the right moment and i kind of enjoyed its stupidity I don't know. I'm giving it... What a softy. Uh, maybe. What a softy Matt's become. <laughs> maybe. Maybe I'm starting to like romantic comedies. <laughs> so, somebody take me out back and old yeller me. All right. I'm going two and a half jaws. I think that's the, the proper place to, to put this movie. I enjoyed it, but I'm not going to go off the, the rails and say it's a three jaw movie. Two and a half jaws. How about you, Rye? I'm... I'm right in the middle of the road here, two jaws. I don't think it's an absolute uh, crapper. For a streamer, it works. That's all I'll say. And you were right saying it's for the right people. It's not necessarily for the people who liked kind of, kinds of kindness right. exactly. to sit down and watch this movie. It's for a different crowd. The crowd that doesn't like kinds of kindness can go ahead and watch a family affair. <laughs> and some people, maybe they just like you know, a predictable romantic comedy with a happy ending. Sometimes you need that. This is, you could do worse. I, I've said it a couple times now, but I, I think it's a public service announcement, frankly. KP looks All right, like she's, that one. KP looks like she's holding back a laugh. I, I gotta like know what's on your mind there, KP. I'm still thinking about the old yeller comment. That was like kind of extreme. It was kind of extreme. <laughs> Thank like... you for calling me out on that. Yeah, I didn't want to let that one go by. <laughs> I was just going to make my face on Zoom and leave this like. <laughs> hey, oh, hey people de develop and change as they get older. And here I am. What can I say? I'm a softie. He's turned soft on us. A family affair on Netflix. If you see it, Jawheads, let us know what you think. Shoot us an email. Feedback at cinemajaw.com. All right. We ready to wrap this one up with some trivia, Matt? I am. Yeah. Let's do it. In honor of A Family Affair, which starred Nicole Kidman and Zac Efron, that's what we're playing. Kidman, Efron, movie trivia. You need three or more correct not to be stumped. All right. Here we go, Matt. Question number one. Zac starred in the 2017 movie Baywatch. Who played the lead in that movie? Lieutenant Mitch Buchanan. Dwayne The Rock Johnson. That is correct. Did you ever see it? I never saw never it. Never saw it. No, me neither. Question two, Matt. Nicole Kidman starred in the 2005 film Bewitched. Which actor played the lead Darren Stevens in the movie? Will Boom Boom Ferrell. That is correct. You are two for two. 
Boy, oh boy. Question three, and I know Matt's seen this movie. Let's see if he remembers it, though. Nicole Kidman played Dev Patel's adoptive mother in this 2016 film. Do you remember the film I'm talking about? No. <laughs> Take him out back. Yeah. <laughs> oh, let's see here. Dev Patel. Nicole Kidman played Dev Patel's adoptive mother in this 2016 film. Boy, I don't feel like digging through my messed up brain anymore tonight. So I'm just going to say, I don't know. What What is it? Monkey <laughs> Man 2. No, we... But it did have a it did have an animal in the title. We were looking for lion. Lion, yeah, yeah. Good movie. Shit, man. It that was, was a good, good movie. movie. Yeah, it really yeah. was. Matt is two for three. Question four. He needs one of these last two. Are you ready, I'm Matt? I'm ready. Zach Efron stars with Seth Rogen, Rose Byrne, and Dave Franco in this comedy and its sequel. Zach Efron, Rose Byrne, and who? S- Seth Rogen and Dave Franco. Comedy and its sequel? Right. Not sure if you've seen these movies. Um, I think we reviewed the first one on the jaw. I did, but. Oh, that's great. I'm 99% oh, yeah, 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 yeah. sure we did the second one, too. It's, it's, about, it's about his neighbor. Is it just called. No, it's got like a, it's got like a pun in the title. Um, I'll just say neighbors. That, my friend, is correct. <laughs> wow. Neighbors and neighbors too. Yes. Uh, Matt is not stumped this week. He gets his third one correct. Question five, Matt, over to you. Kidman played Lucille Ball in Being the Ricardos. Name two other actors who appeared in the film. We reviewed it here on the jaw. This is not to be confused with the Javier Bardem um, film where he plays Ricky Ricardo, correct? <laughs> or, or or is it that one? Is, is it? Just tell me that. It, it is that one. It is that one. Javier Bardem. That is one of them, yes. <laughs> And, um, oh man. Oh, 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 oh. I'm trying to remember who played, uh, Fred and Ethel. Right. You would know Fred. This is where I thought you would go. Oh, fr- oh, um, J.K. Simmons. It is J.K. Simmons. <laughs> yes. Well done, Matt Kay. Wow. Tony Hale from Arrested Development also appears in there. Also from Arrested Development, uh, Aaliyah Shawcat from... Also appears in there. So. Is she Ethel? No, I don't. I didn't write down the actress who was Ethel. Yeah. We, we we wouldn't have got her. Okay. Usually in my notes when I ask those questions, I just write down who I think Matt would know. It's fair because I'm just looking for for your answers. It's, you know. Yeah, it's fair. It's fair. It is. Matt gets four out of five. Well done, Matt. Kay. Hey, man. I I may not be on my movie poster quote game, but I am on my trivia game, and I guess that's even more important. Indeed, always on their game is KP, and that's where we got to start our thank yous. Thank you, KP. Oh, of course. And it's just, yeah, love to hear the compliments and praise and uh, terrified for the day when you guys find out I am never on my game. I'm just good at faking it. (laughs) And hey, why don't we also thank our patrons on Patreon? Uh, You guys are the best and we, we couldn't do this without you. We really, really appreciate it. If you want to join in on the fun, just go to patreon.com slash cinemajaw, and there's a bunch of bonus content and all kinds of fun things. Uh, it's a great place to to go and hang out with other jawheads. Absolutely. And if you can't support us there, another way to do so is just by leaving us a review or star rating on any of the apps that you're currently listening to the podcast on. That helps us attract new listeners. Until next week, I'm Rye the Movie Guy. I'm Matt Kay. And And keep keep on on John about about the movies. movies.